Hi there, and welcome to Context Free, where we talk about programming languages. Today, I'm excited for guest Ashley Williams, who is a member of the Rust Language Core team. She's also Interim Executive Director of the newly announced Rust Foundation, although this interview was recorded and the video is mostly prepared before the announcement in January, when all I knew was that she was co-lead of the Foundation Project Group. And as usual before an interview, I like to give a demo. Rust is becoming a somewhat well-known language, but I still think it could be worth giving an example. For those who might not know, Rust is a systems programming language without garbage collection. It lives somewhat in the same space as C++, but it emphasizes functional programming and memory safety, among other differences. So here I've defined a struct to represent calling a command and whether we might want it to run asynchronously. So for example, like the ampersand on the back of a shell command in Unix. Here's an example of, say, the wget command that we might want to run async. But all we'll do for this demo is just print it out. So let's run this using the cargo command, which is the package manager and build tool for Rust. And we see that our command has named wget and run async is true. To understand memory safety, let's take a look at making another command. Where our intention is to reuse the command name from command one, but now we'll have run async be false. Notice I have both a warning and an error here, which we can see also by trying to run it. The warning is that we haven't used command two, and the error is that we're using command one after the value is partially moved into command two. Or in other words, this capital S string in Rust is sort of like standard string in C++. It manages allocated memory. And the way I've written it here, it's owned by the command structure. So this string is owned by command one, but when I use it for command two, it moves the ownership from command one to command two, so command one now no longer owns the name. You can also borrow references in Rust, but I'm not doing that here. To make this work in this case, we can clone the name, and now each has its own copy. And to get rid of the warning, we can use command two. So we run it again. We see two commands with wget and run async true and false. Another thing I want to emphasize is the Rust 2018 edition changes to the language. Rust 1.0 came out in 2015, and a new edition came out in 2018, which is the default these days. And in Rust 2018, async is a keyword because of language level async support. So for example, I can't change run async to just async because it's a keyword. However, back when Rust first came out, it was not a keyword, and I could name my struct field this. So if I run this, it works fine. So the trick used by Rust to allow async to be a keyword now is by being able to control the addition being used in my program. And in the underlying semantics of the language, it's perfectly okay to have Rust 2018 code calling and using a library written in Rust 2015. Anyway, with the demo done, let's get on to the interview. And the visuals I'll be showing, I added after the interview with Ashley. Also worth pointing out that this video will not include the entire interview, so I'll be releasing a part two later. That said, let's get started. Could you please introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, hi, my name is Ashley Williams, also known as AG Dubs on the internet. I'm a member of the Rust core team, and I've been a member and or leader of many of the Rust teams over the course of the <laughs> Rust history. And I guess we're here to talk about Rust. <laughs> awesome. So how did you get involved in Rust originally, and how did you become a part of the core team? trying to remember exactly how long ago it was. I've been on the Rust core team, I think for a little over three years now. I guess back in the day, I, I started my, my programming journey in Ruby, I guess if I don't go all the way back to Logo. Then I went into Node and I had been participating a lot in Node open source governance in particular, thinking about like, how can we make this a more transparent, more participatory organization? And uh, I'll spare everyone the details, but that went... <laughs> potentially less well than I wanted, but it made me very interested in the topic. And I'd always been kind of adjacent to Mozilla. I had worked briefly at Mozilla before my time at NPM on the foundation side. Uh, and I knew a lot of folks over there. And I had been hearing about this thing called Rust, and in particular, this really kind of radical work that Rust had been doing in its community and governance work. And as I was kind of turning away from Node and looking for something the, to work on, I, uh, I kind of stumbled upon Rust. It, it turned out that my first project was actually, I had been getting into operating systems kind of as a hobby at the time. 
And my partner had started building out this hobby operating system in Rust. And I was like, this seems really cool. And we started building it out and I, I just got super hooked. Very cool. Uh, so actually in terms of the history of Rust itself, I know it was originally led by Graydon Hoare, but things have changed a lot since the early days. How did we get from where it started to where it is now? Yeah, so that's a somewhat large question, but it's a good one. So Rust was kind of originally conceived of, and I would say incubated to certain levels at Mozilla. And there's a couple of really great talks. I don't know if folks here know JavaScript, Marian Haverbeek, who wrote Eloquent JavaScript, which is how I learned to program. Uh, he was one of the original folks working on Rust at Mozilla, and he gives a really awesome talk on the Rust that could have been, like think garbage collection. In, like there's all sorts of things that were in Rust that they took out. So it started as a research project at Mozilla. And the cool thing about this is that Mozilla always conceived of Rust as being something bigger than Mozilla. And the idea was always to kind of let it free where it's become as successful as it appears it's becoming now. And so when Rust stabilized, when Rust 1.0 came out, which was May 15th, 2015, which is easy for me to remember, thankfully, the 1515 part. But the goal with that was not only to stabilize the language, but to also stabilize an independent governance organization. And so with 1.0, we shipped a stable version of the language, but it was also a series of teams, including the core team, and some ideas about making decisions in the open, the concept of no new rationale, which is to say it wasn't going to be a group of folks at Mozilla kind of chatting about ideas and then kind of a PR landing somewhere on GitHub. But the idea that all of these things needed to be dis discussed in the open via the kind of infamous RFC process that Rust has. So we shipped that at the same time too. And I think one of the most exciting things about Rust is that Rust is not only a language, but also this ecosystem, you know, with Crates I own Cargo, but also this governance strategy. And so when Rust 1.0'd, we 1.0'd all three of those things. And I think that's just as integral to Rust as the language primitives themselves. Thank you. So <laughs> in terms of Rust and governance and so on and Mozilla, there was the news this year, the layoffs at Mozilla. So one question is, how did that impact development on Rust since there were paid full-time engineers who were let go? And how does that relate to ongoing news of been hearing, including all the plans for the Rust Foundation? Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing I want to say is the layoffs at Mozilla were, I think, like tremendously like sad and disappointing. Um, there were a lot of really awesome folks who were paid full time to work on Rust at Mozilla, and they lost their jobs during a pandemic, which I would never wish on anyone. Thankfully, it seems they've all found really fantastic places to land. And while I'm not going to speak for all of them, I would say that at least of the ones that I know, their paid open source time on Rust is at least somewhat maintained across that. So I don't think we're going to see like necessarily a huge shift there. But I also think that it's been something that's been unclear to, I think, a lot of both the Rust community and the broader kind of Rust community, which is the number of people who make Rust happen that were employed at Mozilla was very, very, very small. And so... Rust had already been designed to be independent. And again, while it was definitely super not cool to see those folks lose their jobs, Rust has been designed for several years now to be able to withstand something like that. And so, while again, very sad, the fundamental changes that happened to Rust and Rust moving forward as Rust does were functionally actually very small, which is something that I think both Mozilla and the Rust teams are, are actually quite proud of, that we've built something that, that can be that resilient. But moving towards this idea of a foundation, we are going to be announcing very soon, and I've been spending a, a lot of my time working on this foundation. We're really, really excited. This was always the goal that Mozilla had, was that Rust would become an independent entity. And one of the things that, that we're particularly excited about is being able to bring together all of these other organizations that have been both publicly and sometimes not so publicly already talking about their adoption of Rust and having them be able to work together, but also to a certain extent, take responsibility for that privilege of being being able to use open source technology by giving back to 
the organization. And Mozilla had employed many folks full-time to work on Rust open source. And we're hoping to incentivize other organizations to do so as well. One of the biggest threats when you see an open source project like Rust start getting adopted by a lot of organizations is that all of these fantastic engineers who are currently spending their time working in open source on the technology suddenly get scooped up into fantastic engineering jobs at these organizations, but they're no longer working on the technology. They're asked to work with the technology. And this can lead, unless you're incredibly disciplined, to a type of brain drain in the project. Nobody intends for this to happen. It tends to be a kind of system effect. But I think we've seen this happen a number of times with other open source technologies. And so as Rust makes this transition into like a relatively heavily used language in enterprise organizations, that we build in the system of affordances and incentives to keep folks working on the open source technology and not see them all transition to working with it. And I would say, at least personally, in the work that I've been doing on the foundation, that's one of my biggest goals is how can we find a way, like a lot of previously existing open source foundations were really focused on getting technology adopted, like, oh, it's open source, but you should still want to use it in the enterprise. I think we're kind of past that level. I think adoption of Rust is going to happen. I mean, we're seeing it happen already. And I think the, the next step for foundations to address is like, how can we be sure that these things can be sustained and maintained as they get adopted at scale? And so focusing on keeping maintainers happy and present and with the time and space to do the work they need to do is really what we're focusing on. And we think that's just a little bit different than a lot of other software foundations in the past. Awesome. Thank you. Do you have any intentions for a formal specification for Rust or working with any kind of standards body? Yeah, so this is a very timely question. And the first thing I'll say is there is nothing in stone. There is nothing concrete. The number of groups that have to agree to this type of thing are many, and I am but one person. That being said, I don't think there's any disagreement that a formal specification should exist. I think everybody thinks that we really want to formally specify Rust. Now, with that being said, the question of what is the timeline, which is really, really closely related to how we do that formal specification is a really, really interesting question. So as I had kind of said before, Rust is both a language and a how a language gets made, right? And when we look at currently existing standards bodies as they exist today, their methods can be seen in a certain way as kind of the opposite of how a lot of decisions get made in Rust. And so, while I think the desire to not, you know, invent a standards body from first principles, which sounds like no fun at all, um, I, I think we need to find a way to be able to tell, at least tell a story, if not like formally create a, a somewhat at least modified process about how we can take existing standards bodies and move them closer to the process of how Rust as a community makes decisions. And so I think, <laughs> I think that's the work to be done. There's a lot of benefits to working through an existing standards body. And I, I, they're, they're, there's just a ton of them there. And so I think this kind of governance work of like, how do we want to approach a formal specification is kind of the complicated problem. And that will absolutely affect the timeline, but a formal specification is absolutely desired. Really, we've seen a lot of attention pick up on this probably in like the last six months. And I expect some more official sounding discussions about the plan will start happening over the course of this year. That's awesome. Now, on the idea of the evolution of the Rust language, the additions notion, like the 2018 edition, I found very interesting. Do you think that this additions thing can continue to keep the Rust language clean as it evolves? Yeah. So there's a couple of things in here just to kind of split them out a little bit. So one thing is the, the idea of a technology to slowly get messy over time. This is an issue near and dear to my heart. And then there's this idea of additions. So one of the biggest, like kind of, like, when Rust first came out, we had these kind of marketing taglines, like hack without fear, you know, but one of the other ones was stability without stagnation. And so this was really important to us. We wanted people to be able to rely on a language, but we want to be able to continue to make changes. And if you kind of insist on 
constant backwards compatibility, which I think we see right now with some of the web technologies are really struggling with this, where kind of like the context has changed and initial primitives that they might want to to be able to fix because of this constant focus on backwards compatibility, they might not be able to clean it up. And we want to avoid that. And so I do think the work that we've done with the compiler to be able to kind of make these like opt in, like can work together, but like we're slowly kind of changing keywords and stuff over time. I think that it's a really interesting strategy. Now, the interesting thing about this strategy is I think the devils are in the details. So we did our first edition for 2018 and we kind of always thought of these being every three years. And so if you'll note, what year is it? It's 2021, right? Which means we should probably have an edition this year. And so if you've been paying attention to the RFC repo on Rust, there's been a fair amount of discussion on this and there's been some discussion on the core team about this as well. And The neat thing about additions is we want the ability to make breaking changes. But the question about what's the right size of breaking changes, like what is the right grouping, like how do we define the set of changes that happens in an addition, I think is a really interesting question. And it's something that in our first edition, we didn't really kind of solidify. And in fact, when we conceived of additions with the first 2018 edition, folks really deep in the project recall this very deeply is it was not only the like technical 2018 edition work in the compiler add addition to the cargo.toml. It was this huge marketing push. It was a new website. It was other additions. So we conceive of additions also as potentially changes in ecosystem and tooling and kind of like eras or epoch, but we see them as these kind of like generations within the Rust project. And it was a really cool idea, but the issue is we didn't really have the capacity to pull it off. And I'll say the 2018 edition taught the project that project management in open source is critical and really, really important. And I know for many people thinking about a systems programming language like Rust, like, is there space for people who, you know, really love like Trello or Jira or organizing projects? And I'd love to kind of shamelessly use this moment to say, Absolutely, yes. We kind of had a a crisis of project management and we wrote a retrospective about it. But in order to pull off these additions, there's a lot of work there. And so I think the dream of needing a way to be able to remain backwards compatible while being able to make breaking changes will help keep the language and the ecosystem and, and the project in general kind of clean or neatened up over time. But the effort is huge. And so I think our ability to really pull that off will be our ability to really build the infrastructure of the project and its governance to be able to manage that, which people might not expect. 